Hi, I'm Tim Clark, and this is Conversations About the Vietnam War. My guest today is Bob Parmley. Uh, he was a uh, O'Day High School graduate uh, of 1964, and he served in the 25th Infantry Division uh, of the U.S. Army. Uh, so, uh, Bob, uh, uh, you were actually uh, coming from Bremerton when you were going to high school, is that correct? That's correct. I was born and raised in Bremerton, Washington, and got a scholarship to go to O'Day High School. So. I would commute on the ferry when I wasn't uh, uh, busy in uh, activities like football and track. Okay. All right. So uh, you get out of high school. You're still living in Bremerton. Uh, what are you doing with your time? Uh, my first job, uh, I was getting ready to go to Olympic Junior College, start Olympic Junior College, and I got a job at J.C. Penney's as a uh, shoe salesman in the shoe department. And uh, I worked that for about three or four months, and then at the time, uh, the uh, Bangor Ammunition Depot over uh, in Kitsap County was uh, busy uh, trying to get workers to uh, work as stevedores loading uh, ammunition on the uh, victory ships that were uh, going to Vietnam resupplying uh, munitions over there. They uh, were very high paying jobs and uh, finding kids right out of high school anxious to buy new cars and that sort of thing. Uh, everybody signed up. Uh, unfortunately when you did that and you dropped out of uh, college you lost your college deferment. So from that point on, you were the next thing going to Vietnam. All right, so the draft call is starting to pick up and you knew the call was going to show up. Yep. So um, when did you actually get your draft notice? Uh, I believe I got my uh, draft notice in uh, sometime in November of 1965. Uh, I was actually inducted on December 8th, 1965. It was a two-year active duty uh, requirement. And uh, you then, uh, uh, typically what happens to a, an ordinary uh, draftee in the Army, you're going to go through basic training. In the West Coast, they normally would have sent you to Fort Ord. You actually did get sent to Fort Ord, but then what happened? Um, that's correct. I was uh, uh, sworn in in Seattle, put on a bus, taken out to the airport, flown to Fort Ord, California. Uh, for uh, what they called the reception center, and this was the prelude to starting basic training. At that time, uh, the uh, uh, Army was experiencing, especially at, at uh, Fort Ord, a spinal meningitis epidemic, and they were very fearful of bringing a lot of new troops in there for fear that they would you know, come down with a spinal meningitis. Uh, so what they did is after we'd been there 10 days, they turned around and bust us back to the airport and flew us back to Seattle and the Army set up a uh, temporary, I guess for lack of a better term, basic training center at Fort Lewis, Washington. There was plenty of room at Fort Lewis, uh, Fort Lewis being one of the larger bases in the country. So we had, uh, we were back in Tacoma about a week before Christmas. Uh, a good majority of our division were, were uh, draftees from the Pacific Northwest, so the Army uh, decided that anybody who lived within 250 miles could go home for Christmas for, on a five-day non-charged pass, which we did, and then everybody would return to Fort Lewis uh, by the first of the year, 1966, and then we would start our basic training. All right, so you're you're uh, you're uh, you're in basic. Uh, you you get through that that tour, and you then go into advanced infantry training. That's correct. And then uh, two months after that, you're into unit training. Basic unit training. The the, the basic training uh, system was basically a six month training period broken into three segments. The first one being called basic training. That's your first induction into the army. Uh, learning the rules, learning you know what the Army's all about. The, the second two-month period is what they call advanced infantry training. We were an infantry division, so it was just more involved in the, than the previous two-month uh, training period. And then the last two months was basic unit training, and that's where some of uh, the troops were uh, peeled off and sent into different categories of, of, uh, of service for the Army. Uh, some would go into medical, some would go into uh, police, uh, you know, where, wherever the, the Army needed them. But the majority of them being infantry people would stay with the infantry group. So you do get assigned to, uh, well, you're given notice that you're going to be shipped to Vietnam and you're assigned to a specific unit? Yes, we, uh, uh, we started basic training, like I said, in January of 66, and we were finished with our six months of, uh, of training approximately June, July. At that point, uh, it was no secret that we were going to Vietnam. That was at the height of the war in 1966 when I think we had the most uh, 
Americans serving over there in the entire war, something over 325,000. Uh, and of course, we were a division still in the United States, so everybody uh, pretty much assumed we were going to be the next to go, and then the government announced that we were going. Uh, so we were uh, required to start loading up all of our equipment. Trucks had to be prepared for overseas shipment, uh, equipment. Uh, we basically got ready to pack up and leave. Everything was taken down to the port of Tacoma, loaded on transport ships, and all the equipment left about 60 days before we did, and then finally it was our turn, so we shipped out on September 21st of 1966. Now, uh, you actually made a personal life decision uh, in that summer and uh, uh, went from being single to married, I understand. That's correct. In uh, uh, the gal that I was with had uh, got pregnant, and uh, the only opportunity that I had to uh, uh, to get married was uh, over the Fourth of July uh, weekend prior to us leaving. That was the uh, all, all leaves had been canceled because we were getting ready to go overseas. So I had an understanding second lieutenant that uh, I explained that I had to go to Idaho because I was not even old enough to get married in the state of Washington. So he gave me a three-day pass to use in conjunction with the 4th of July, and we drove over to Coeur d'Alene and got married and uh, then came back to Fort, Fort Lewis, and next thing I know, I was on the ship. So how old were you when you graduated from high school? Seventeen. So just a little younger than... Yeah. Yeah, the normal crew. All right, um, y you're off with the uh, 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 4,000 uh, uh, folks on board a boat, uh, part of the 3rd Brigade, is that correct? And uh, uh, you eventually arrive uh, uh, in a barge uh, off the coastline of uh, uh, Vietnam for foreign loading, is that correct? That's correct. We left on a uh, an old World War II era military uh, troop transport, which was um, very uncomfortable for 22 days. Uh, we sailed out of the port of uh, Tacoma, uh, left on the 22nd or 21st of September. We got into uh, Vung Tau Harbor in uh, southeast of Saigon in Vietnam about 22 days later. Uh, they brought, uh, this was a huge harbor where all your supplies and, and uh, equipment came into uh, the country because it was uh, a very secure harbor. When I got there, there was probably 50 or 60 cargo ships uh, anchored in, in the bay at that time. Uh, what they did is over the period of the next three days, they brought barges out uh, alongside of the troop transport and then uh, they threw rope ladders over the side and for three days uh, we disembarked the troop transport onto the landing craft, onto the barges and then they brought landing craft out to the barges. We loaded onto the landing craft and then the landing craft took us onto the beach in Vungtau Harbor. All right, so uh, they've got to get you uh, all collected in a temporary base. Correct. And then it's about uh, redistribution. Now, uh, are all of you going to the same locale? Yes, we're right. everybody in our brigade. All right, and where's that brigade? What's the uh, route and, and destination? From the time that we arrived in uh, Vungtau Harbor, which uh, happened to be an in-country R&R center, by the way, uh, we convoyed for about 20 miles, I believe it was, up towards Saigon and Long Bin, which was the supply depot for the, the country. And they uh, put us in a, uh, a base camp up there, I believe it was called Bearcat. And it was occupied by the 1st Infantry Division, the one you see in the movies called the Big Red One. And we were to spend 90 days with them as part of our in-country indoctrination. I mean, so what kind of training did you actually get in that particular locale? Jungle fighting, how to, how to deal with uh, uh, jungle fighting in a jungle environment. All right, so your basic training doesn't really cover that. I mean, basic training is just that. It's just basic training, how the military does this, this is your weapon, so on and so forth. What you don't know is that over in Vietnam, uh, uh, different booby traps, different, different ways of, of fighting that we were not used to. And that's what the 1st uh, Division uh, was there to teach us, kind of uh, show us the rope, so to speak. Now, does that include transportation routes, how you arrive in, in, uh, in-country? No. So no, all we that is going to simply become on-the-job training? Correct. Okay. All right, so uh, where from uh, the training? Uh, so the, the uh, in-country training with the 1st Division lasted about 90 days. So we now were approximately January of 1967, 
And now we're getting ready to go to our ultimate destination, which was Dao Tiang, which was a, an old Michelin rubber plantation on the Cambodian-Vietnam border. To get there, uh, we convoyed over a number of days from this Bearcat uh, through, through Long Ben and Saigon. We convoyed right through downtown Saigon and went, uh, followed an old highway that led out to Kuchi, which is where our division headquarters, this is another brigade that, had, that got there before we had, uh, had set up as uh, their headquarters, and that was actually the last safe city in, uh, in, in that, that roadway that led up to the border. Uh, from Kuchi, we went on to Tainin City, which was a, a pretty good-sized city uh, that was occupied by the U.S. military, the 196th Light Infantry Brigade. They manned that one. That was a very uh, hostile area, and then from there we convoyed ultimately to our destination, which was Dao Tiang, this rubber plantation that was, I'm not sure exactly how far, but it was fairly close to the Cambodian border. So uh, even as you're in transit, you came under fire, is that correct? The very first day that we convoyed out of uh, Saigon, heading up towards Kuchi, uh, uh, we were mortared that day, and uh, we had I believe 30, 40 vehicles that all sustained damage from uh, flattened tires. So we were stuck there for two days while S&T Company rounded up tires to, to get up to our trucks. S&T? Uh, S&T, I'm sorry, is supply and transportation. They're the, uh, uh, the combination Lowe's and, and hardware store of today. They, uh, they provide, uh, well, supplies and transportation. To. All right, so they're rolling out trucks full of tires because you got to put tires Correct. on. Correct. We can't move because uh, the, the enemy basically disabled us with all these mortar shells that came in and blew out all the tires. So they obviously were very well aware of troop movement. Yes. So they... It was later determined, uh, if, if, you, if you've read a lot of the, the stories you know, written about the war, that uh, the Vietnamese had a, a, a very involved tunnel system, and it came out later on, I don't think anybody knew it at the time, that uh, their tunnels actually were right underneath our division headquarters in Coo Chi, which was uh, felt to be the safest place in the country. All right, uh, you're headed out uh, towards uh, Dao Tiang. You're now uh, brought on board the base. What's inside the base? What are we looking at? It was an old uh, Michelin rubber plantation that had approximately nine or ten uh, French-style buildings that had been built there. Uh, th these buildings were for uh, the Michelin uh, executives. Uh, they actually had a, an above-grade swimming pool, good-sized swimming pool that was there. Obviously, these were in disrepair since the French uh, you know, had left country. Uh, and then uh, a number of uh, outbuildings uh, for residences and, and, and whatnot. And then there was also a, uh, an airstrip there that the French, or that the Michelin people had used, uh, again, to transport their executives and, and people and sort of thing. Uh, other than that, that was it. Well, when you get located on the, uh, uh, the base, it's, uh, first of all, it is a secured base, is that correct? Yeah, advanced parties had set up a perimeter. There was bunker system in place. Uh, the perimeters were mined, uh, uh, barbed wire, you know, around the entire base. And it, it was a good-sized base. I don't recall exactly how large, but it was a base for 4,000 people, so it's a town for 4,000 people. All right. Now, when you say bunkers, what, what am I talking and how many? Uh, well, bunkers were probably placed every 40 to 50 feet along the entire perimeter of, of, the, uh, of the base camp, what was defined as the perimeter of the base camp. Uh, are these trenches? Are they sandbags? These are sandbag uh, bunkers, like you see in the war movies where they hunker down, they got the little slots, and they're firing out from there. Okay, so it's, it's uh, uh, preparing for being under fire. Yes. All right. Uh, you, uh, when you arrive there, uh, you're assigned to the 704th Maintenance Brigade. Is that correct? It was later uh, renamed the 725th because of the 25th Infantry Division. But yeah, it's, it was the same same unit. All right. So uh, uh, when when you're in process going out, uh, obviously once you're established there as a base, you get resupplied basically every day. Is that correct? Correct. Every day. In the early morning, they would have a staging area inside our base camp, and you'd have roughly 20 to 25 uh, uh, deuce and a half trucks. These are cargo trucks, uh, smaller vehicles, uh, ambulances, uh, 
tanker trucks going going into the supply depot in Long Bend. It on a good day, if if there weren't a lot of, of uh, mines that were detected and no harassing fire or anything like that, the convoy could make it from our location all the way into Long Bend, right outside of Saigon, which is where the major resupply depot was at, was located. If there were a lot of mines, you didn't get started for four or five hours late in the morning, then you tried to make it to Tainan City and you laid over there. Who takes care of the mines? Uh, the engineers do. And uh, are they going out in terms of walking the road? Is it a vehicle? How do they do that? They, uh, when we were there, uh, they, they obviously had vehicles, but they had mine detectors and they would walk the roads. And they, they, they would start to develop a pattern on where the, the enemy was going to place mines. So. So there was some anticipatory set yes. after. Uh, you could tell where the soil had been disturbed and that sort of thing. But, you know, they're not perfect. They didn't get them all the time. So uh, we lost a lot of trucks and a lot of lives to vehicles blowing up, running over mines. Because that's part of the cost of maintaining a yep. forward base. All right. Uh, the, uh, uh, on the base, you also have uh, artillery uh, for support fire. Is that correct? That's correct. We had a 105 howitzer uh, uh, battery and we had a 155 howitzer battery. Now that uh, 155 is a larger type yes, weapon? Yes, it's a larger, it's a, a 155 millimeter. And uh, how often are those guns going off? They could go off every day. Uh, our, the the uh, in, in base camp tent that I resided in was right next door to the artillery thing. So you'd be asleep and 10.30 she'd open up. So uh, it, it depended on, on your field troops that were out on patrols or something. If they felt they needed artillery support, uh, they'd call it in and that's what the artillery was there for, was to support them. All right, let's talk a little bit about the makeup of the, of the uh, uh, 725th and uh, what types of facilities and, and uh, machinery uh, do you actually have on base? The maintenance battalion uh, was responsible for repairing motorized vehicles that would be trucks, jeeps, tanks, uh, armored personnel carriers, that sort of thing, ambulances. Uh, we also had a communications section which was responsible for repairing uh, field radios for infantry troops, you know, with the radio packs. Uh, and then we also had an armament section that was responsible for uh, maintenance and repairs on all sorts of armament, which would be from the artillery uh, units themselves right on down to small arms fires, you know, sidearms for 45 calibers or M14 or M15 uh, or M16 uh, rifles or M60 machine guns, M79 grenade launchers, all of the basic uh, armament that uh, the infantry required, the maintenance battalion was responsible for keeping in what they called uh, third level echelon maintenance, which is one step away from sending it back home to be repaired or destroyed. Okay. Uh, in, uh, 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 you also have uh, means of bringing back the larger vehicles, is that correct? Yes, it was uh, called, a, I think it was an M81 tank uh, retriever. It, it basically was uh, a regular tank without any armament that was used to drag in disabled tanks and uh, armored personnel carriers and any sort of track vehicles that couldn't make it back in on their own. All right, so that means that uh, the troops out in the field uh, are actually coming under significant fire in order to have that type of damage. Mm -hmm. Or ran over a mine or were mortared that damaged the tracks. Okay. Uh, and uh, one of the problems that you've got in order to have a safe base is uh, you have to have 24-7 guard duty. Yes. And who supplies that? Everybody does. So Everybody in the camp pulls guard duty, unless it's on a special assignment. And uh, so if you're assigned guard duty uh, tonight, what's that actually going to translate in terms of your night? You have evening chow. Uh, from there, you go over to your assigned bunker, and you stay there until 6 o'clock the next morning. And usually, how many guys in a bunker? Usually four or five in a bunker. And the idea was that a couple could, could sleep while the other two or three were uh, actively, you know, watching the perimeter. And is this just uh, ordinary rifles that you're uh, uh, on duty with, or are there are other Yes, equipment? but we had, we had access to Claymore mines that had been set in between the barbed wire, so anybody approaching there... Uh, if they got that close, we could set off a Claymore mine. Okay, so the controls were inside the bunker. Yes, were inside the bunker. Okay. Um, the, uh, um, uh, you, it, the airfield uh, that's a part of your base, is there anything parked there or is everything just coming in and out? 
No, it strictly comes in and goes out. Nothing's even shut down. Uh, we would get a uh, resupply plane. This airstrip was big enough to accommodate a C-123 cargo plane. Uh, we get one or two of those a day, which generally would bring in orders, medical supplies, uh, mail, which is a very important thing over there, uh, and, tr and replacement troops, you know, onesie twosie, not major, not major whatever. Uh, helicopters would also use this as a, as a starting point or a transfer point for uh, field operations, uh, either bringing casualties in or, or uh, resupplying you know, more troops or more supplies, food, uh, ammunition, uh, things of that nature. Now, it, it, you uh, also are located next to a village. Yes. Uh, and is, that's part of your uh, 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 ability to repair. What this particular location that we were at, uh, they were fortunate in the, in the small village located right outside our base camp. Uh, there were a couple of old French buildings that had been used. We, don't, we have no idea what they were used for, but they were basically open structures with a roof over them. So we used them like a, a repair garage that you would see, you know, in any city today. I mean, it's just... Uh, no doors, anything like that. So we would have special patrols that would guard those facilities at night, and uh, that's where a lot of the trucks and, and track vehicles would be left overnight and repaired. So, now the airfield, by its very nature, has to have a resupply depot and the ability to get fuel into uh, either aircraft or uh, uh, into uh, vehicles. Uh, how did they store that, and how do you identify it? Well, I think what you're talking about is, is uh, what we call the, the uh, petroleum oil lubricant site. And these were uh, giant rubber bladders that uh, your JP4 jet fuel would be stored in or mo gas, motor gas for motorized vehicles would be stored in. And uh, those would typically be situated someplace within the base camp. Uh, and then the engineers, the engineering battalion assigned to us, would build a six to eight foot high dirt perimeter around those bladders to protect them uh, and protect the troops in case they were hit and, and broke loose. The fuel wouldn't run over the whole base camp. Uh, and those things were resupplied by uh, tanker trucks that we would run in convoys every day. So just like the tanker trucks you see at the gas station today, we'd run one, one or two a day into in the long bin and they'd come back with uh, re replenishment fuel. All right, so uh, as I'm uh, uh, gonna send a convoy out, trucks have to be full of fuel because they're not gonna stop once they're on the road. Right. Uh, when the bladder eventually uh, is flat, do you simply uh, pull it out and put another one in the same locale? No, it's, it's resupplied by the tanker trucks coming in. It's, it's never allowed to get too low. Okay. Because there could be some times when your convoys can't get through for two or three days or you're under attack or something like that. So you have to have, you know, backup, just like backup ammunition and food. Okay. Uh, and uh, part of the, uh, uh, the supply and transportation folks, uh, they're also, uh, they're taking care of everything from food to ice. Is that correct? That's correct. Convoys would go into, into Long Bin and load up. Uh, some trucks would be loaded up with five or six pallets of soda pop for the troops or beer for the troops. Uh, uh, some of the big flatbed trucks would be loaded. They had a nice plant in, in Long Bend, so ice was a, a very valuable commodity over there for obvious reasons. There's no refrigeration or anything. So uh, they would load up these 40-foot uh, trailers, flatbed trailers with ice and then canvas it. And hopefully by the time it got back to your base camp, at the end of the day, you might still have 60% of your ice left. 40% obviously would just melt away. Wow. But uh, then the other, other trucks would be in picking up rations for each, each mess hall. Uh, generally, each company in the, in the base camp would send three or four of their trucks for various you know, supplies every single day. The beer and pop truck, the, uh, the food truck, uh, ammunitions, uh, repair parts, uh, Things like that. I mean, it's well. What it implies then is there's an inventory taking place. It's rechecked and being replaced on just day. a constant basis. And the, the tragedy is, units in the field are going to go through the stuff at incredible rates. And so you have to know exactly how deep into the supplies you you actually are. Correct. And that's just getting those supplies into the base camp. If if you're supporting troops that are out on a field operation where you may have four to six hundred uh, infantry troops out. Uh, you've got to figure out how you're going to get those same supplies out to them. I mean, you just don't load up your pickup truck and drive out in the, 
the All right, so if I've got, uh, for argument's sake, uh, uh, I've, I've got a, a um, mission underway. Uh, if it's your people coming out, how many helicopters am I going to bring in to basically move those people out into the field? Well, it, depend, it depends on how big an operation it is, but generally, um, um, I don't recall exactly. I, I think the, the choppers would fly in groups of six, so you'd get you know, 24 or 30 choppers coming in to pick up troops and take them out or, or extract them, bring them back in. Uh, and then those same uh, helicopters would be used for resupply, which would be you know, uh, armament and food, and then, of course, casualty um, you know, uh, extraction and that type of thing, too. So. All right, so uh, uh, what type of rations do they have in the field? At the time I was in Vietnam, uh, General Westmoreland was the commanding general for everything over there, and he had kind of a standing order that all of the troops in Vietnam would be granted um, uh, two hots a day, I think it was. And what he meant was they would be getting two hot meals a day, one cold, two hots. Your cold uh, rations were sea rations. These are the small boxes with canned fruit cocktail and, and you know, meat dishes and things like that when you couldn't get uh, hot food. The hot food would come out in uh, large uh, food containers, uh, insulated food containers, and uh, usually it wasn't hot even though that's how it was designed because in some cases it would take six hours to get that food out to you. So, but it is kitchen prepared. Yes, it is kitchen prepared. All right. Uh, the, uh, uh, um, you chose to basically move away from the job that you had after about three months. What's going on? I, I, I just didn't like it. The only reason I was in there was, was actually kind of a fluke. When I was drafted, I mentioned to you I was a shoe clerk at Penny's. When I was drafted, they, they, they gave you a preliminary interview and wanted to know what you did in your civilian life. And I said I was a retail clerk. Well, the guy that was doing the report left off the retail and put me down as a clerk. I, I'd never been a clerk in my life. I had no idea. And that followed me through, through the Army. And when I got into my unit, uh, there were very few people that, that could even use a typewriter. I happened to be one of the few that could, so I just inherited the position as the clerk. And so I rep there was two in, in the company. One was the company clerk uh, who had to have the same qualifications, and then the, the maintenance guy. I mean, they had to have somebody who could do reports and, and uh, inventory requests and things like that. So that's really kind of how I got stuck in that. But I got tired of it. And I wasn't really looking for more action. I was, I was really kind of looking for something. Uh, I don't know what I was looking for. Maybe a little safer or something. So I volunteered to drive for the support battalion uh, commander. And he, he was the lieutenant colonel who was responsible for uh, the support division for uh, our brigade. All right. So your problem now is uh, you're going to have to handle... Uh, the uh, larger units going out into the field and larger missions. Right. I wasn't aware of really what that entailed, like most things. I mean, I just volunteered to get out of doing something else, and I thought it would be a pretty safe gig just driving the colonel around a small base camp. Little did I realize that he spent most of his time going out on, on these these uh, these operations supporting the, the field troops, uh, because somebody had to be out there to assess, you know, what they needed, you know, armament, food, medical supplies, engineering equipment, you know, whatever it take to sustain an operation in the field. It's, you just don't send a bunch of infantry guys out there with their rifles and, and say, you know, fight the war. I mean, there's a lot more to it. It's the, the supply and the transportation. All right, so let's take a, a large-scale operation. Uh, maybe it's called Junction City. Okay. And... Uh, uh, They've already, they're already out in the field. They've already been in combat. There's now the need to assess what has actually occurred. How does that involve you and the lieutenant colonel? We, we chop her out to the site, uh, meet with the, uh, I didn't, but he, he would meet with uh, the officers, the infantry officers, uh, to discuss you know, casualties, uh, resupply of, of uh, you know, weapons and munitions. Uh, damage, you know, to uh, to vehicles, track vehicles, trucks, uh, the need for uh, engineering support to uh, uh, build portable mess tents out in the field. Uh, 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 waste disposal was a huge deal. We'd have to uh, fly in uh, big Caterpillar D8 uh, uh, cats to dig huge holes in the terrain, and that's where the garbage and medicals would all be put into and, and uh, incinerated. Uh, 
because uh, you had you know uh, disease uh, issues to, to deal with out there, uh, and that's that's what the support battalion is all about is supporting these guys. I mean, the, the infantry officer uh, officers are responsible for. Uh, the actual fight itself, but they can't fight unless the support is behind them. You know, the engineers and the medics and and the the supply and transportation people. Who's going to fly the ammunition out there? Who's you know who's going to cook the food for them? We had to get the cooks out there. Uh, a lot of things like that that went into it. Okay, so one of the pr uh, tragedies of a large scale operation. Uh, you uh, let's say you were trying to resupply. You you mentioned earlier the Tenth uh, Cavalry. Uh, uh, they're going to be coming in, uh, say, uh, uh, armored personnel uh, carriers. Correct. A and now they've come under fire, and you're going to have to get that stuff either replaced or, or repaired. Mm -hmm. uh, so somebody gets assigned uh, that particular job that's part of one of the units, um, and it, uh, are they going to basically helicopter that stuff out? Uh, if there's no other way to fix it, they usually try and fix everything on the spot, at least make it, you know, so it's mobile and they can get it out. Yeah, for obvious reasons, you don't want to leave equipment, you know, on a, on a battle site where the enemy can come back and, and you know, uh, scavenger, you know, for it. Uh, if you can't get it out, you blow it up. You okay. Know, just dispose of it so nobody else can use it. So, um, eventually... Uh, you find yourself in, involved in what uh, six, seven major operations, mm -hmm. basically cleaning up behind them. Yes, supporting right. them. And, but at uh, at the end of the day, you're brought back to the base, and one would like to believe that, uh, well, for argument's sake, uh, you get uh, R and R. Do you get R and R? Uh, at the time I was there, all the troops were offered one five-day R and R out of country where the government would transport you to uh, Bangkok or Honolulu. They had, they had four or five spots uh, and you could spend five days there kind of away from the war and blowing off steam. They also allowed you, I believe, two in-country R&Rs, which was a three-day stint uh, at the same place we came ashore at in Vung Tau Harbor, which was very similar to a, a Florida beachfront with sandy beaches. It was a very secure area. And you could go down there and, and um, you know, drink beer and sit out in the patios and, you know. All right, so so-called sort of rest and recuperation sites yes. that uh, allowed you to simply extract yourself from a combat uh, situation. Precisely. yep. But in your case? I didn't do either. I had a, uh, I had a wife and a daughter that had just been born, so I sent all my money home. So it's going to cost you money if you do go there, and you don't have any money to basically go, so you're not going? Yeah. Okay. So your tour of duty, you're on that base, you're wired into the pattern of life on that base, and it's understandable when you're out in a, a major mission combat area, you might come under fire, but are you coming under fire back at the base? Yes, I, um, uh, I had sniper fire that would come in at me every now and then. Everybody did. And uh, uh, the, they're targeting the airfield and supply stuff, so... Our base camp, uh, aside from small, small arms fire, sniper fire, that, that really didn't amount to much. The most damage that we ever sustained was uh, mortar attacks. The, uh, the Vietnamese uh, were masters at hiding you know, mortars. They'd just clear a little bit of grass away and, and hide a mortar. Uh, this is in, our, in, in the rubber tree in the, plantations? In the, yeah, in the rubber tree plantations, exactly. And uh, dusk would come, and, uh, or it'd be dark, and uh, they'd sneak out into the fields and uncover their mortar, and they'd lob three or four mortar shells into your base camp and break it back down and be back in their hut in less than 30 seconds. And you couldn't even mobilize and get your armored personnel carrier fired up to get out the gate and, and try and find them. And uh, they could do a lot of damage. We lost a lot of guys from, from random mortar fire. So between the fact that you're losing sleep because your own artillery is coming off every once in a while, you could be walking on the base and find incoming rounds too? Yes. You always knew where the nearest foxhole was at, believe me. You had yes. foxholes on the sides of, the, of every tent, every structure there. And any any time you were walking around, you always knew where the closest foxhole was. So unfortunately, uh, uh, there are people out in the field and uh, they're going to need support fire and sometimes they're in danger of being overrun and that even calls for a special type of fire support. What's going on? 
uh, field people can call in uh, uh, artillery support anytime they need it and the artillery batteries that we had in the base camp were there to provide that for them. Uh, on field operations, uh, I think the, the, what you're referring to is kind of the worst case scenario, a do or die, uh, when you're in danger of being overrun and there, there is no other solution. Uh, we had at the time, I don't know if they still have it, uh, what was called a beehive round. And what it was was an artillery shell filled with literally thousands of small metal barbs, uh, very similar to a, a, a lady's bobby pin. And these things would, uh, the shell would blow up and these beehive rounds would basically perforate anything in its path. And if a, a human was, got caught by one of them, it would probably be penetrated two, three hundred times. So when you call that in, you're basically killing every it's, living thing in the area. Yep, it's do or die. It's, it's either them or you. Uh, so, uh, sadly, that type of stress of living on a base like that begins to show up in terms of its impact on the people working there. Mm -hmm. uh, did you have a case that you encountered? Uh, I personally, you know, I had my own issues going on. Um, when, I, when I went to Vietnam, I was convinced I was not coming back. I had no no qualms about that. I was, just figured it was over, which is why I was sending the money home, too. Uh, we had uh, a, a good friend of mine in my unit. I think he was a truck mechanic or a, a, you know, a track mechanic. Uh, I believe he, he suffered from a type of uh, Tourette syndrome. And uh, we first started to notice it you know, after we were at, at Dao Tiang. And uh, we didn't pay too much attention to it. It was kind of, was kind of a, a, a joking matter. And uh, his name was Nick. He was from New York. And uh, Nick, uh, he, was, he was a good guy, and, and he said, oh, no, it's nothing, don't worry about it. Well, it got progressively worse, and, and by the time he'd been there in country four or five um, months, he had a bad habit of, of slapping his forehead like this. And uh, after four or five months, his head actually started to swell, and we finally you know, got the medics to evacuate him out of there, and that was it. We don't know what ever happened to him after that. And uh, tragically, of course, uh, if you're going to come under fire, you're going to have people that uh, uh, are, are going to be medevaced out even that day. So uh, casualties are just part of life there. But mm -hmm. you, you end up with people that also make mistakes uh, even when they're simply uh, uh, trying to carry out their job. Uh, you mentioned a, a one gentleman by the name of Tony. I think that uh, he was one of our cooks from our base camp, and uh, we were out on. In fact, I think it was the Junction uh, City uh, operation, and he was one of the cooks that had gone out as a support person, you know, just like the medics and whatever. And uh, part of his everyday duty out in the field. This is not in our base camp, but out in the field. Uh, was to take the garbage and dump it in the garbage pit and then set the garbage on fire, incinerate everything. They also would do this with medical supplies and that sort of thing. And Tony, uh, he was from Philadelphia, uh, Italian kid, uh, real nice, you know, just one of the brothers. Everybody was pretty close with one another. And uh, he had taken the garbage uh, into the pit one day. He had walked down into the pit. Again, this cat had taken the blade and just dug a 10-foot deep hole, probably... 10 yards by 10 yards. This is where we would incinerate all the garbage and human waste and that sort of thing. And uh, he took a gas can, a five gallon can of, uh, of gas, went down and, and sprayed the area down with the gas can and he was horsing around and uh, forgot that he had slopped gas on him and he went to light up a cigarette and set himself on fire and we never saw him again either. They medevaced him out and he was pretty bad. I'm sure he made it way back to Texas to the burn center. Okay. Uh, fortunately, eventually, this does come to an end, and uh, you are able to begin to actually look at uh, extracting yourself. You get uh, what we call port call, is that correct? Right, which was basically just a notification that your time was up and you had a seat on a plane to get out of there, So, which is the number one thing every GI looked for. So uh, what's the beginning point? You're on the base. Uh, then what happens? Well, you go to your own your own company supply sergeant. You uh, you turn in your weapon, you know, because they have to keep track of the weapons. Uh, pick up your orders from the company clerk, and uh, have somebody run you over to the airstrip. And uh, you go through the uh, uh, the admin, which is another function of the support people. You have an admin uh, uh, section that processes paperwork and orders and that sort of thing. 
and uh, you process out, and uh, when the C-123 comes in, you get on that plane and head to Tonsonet, Saigon. All right, so now you're at a, a major airfield outside of Saigon. Mm -hmm. Do you get leave inside of Saigon? No. So no, because you're on the uh, in the base itself, which is a secure area. Okay, and uh, then do you transfer to uh, another military craft or? The way I was extracted uh, was uh, at the time the U.S. government chartered U.S. airliners to fly replacement troops over other than us, went over on the, the ship, and to extract uh, troops back out of Vietnam. And what they would do, I think I flew in on a, or left on a TWA plane, and the plane flew in to Tonsonut. They weren't allowed to shut down their engines or anything. They would just fly in, offload replacement troops, and then the guys that were heading home would onload. That plane would then turn around and fly over to uh, Kadena Air Force Base there in the Philippines, which was only, I think, 45 minutes away. That's where they would switch crews, uh, re clean the plane, refuel the plane. From there, we flew to uh, Honolulu, and we were allowed to get off there for 30 minutes just to do some physical exercise. And then from there, we flew into uh, California, okay. Travis Air Force Base, and that's where we were released. All right, and uh, at that point, you're also given some leave, is that correct? Yeah, I, uh, I mistakenly broke the golden rule over there, which is to never believe what the Army tells you. But at the time, they had what they called a 90-day early out clause, which meant that if you got back into the United States with 90 days or less of active time to do, they would just automatically let you go. There was no reason to keep you. Uh, I had it figured that I was going to have 93 days left when I got in there, so I asked the officer in Vietnam, I said, can I just stay here for four days? So I get in at 89 days, and he said, oh, don't worry about it, they're going to let you go. So <laughs> I didn't, and sure enough, I got to Travis Air Force Base, and the guy handed me an envelope, and I said, what is that? And he said, it's your orders, you're going to uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, Colorado Springs. It's been my last 60 days. So I had I had a month's worth of leave, plus two five-day travel uh, leaves, one to get back to Bremerton, and then one to get out to Colorado. So I really only had 63 days left to spend. Uh, didn't have any of my, uh, uh, my gear. Uh, I got out there, reported to the uh, reception uh, station there. The op commanding officer there said uh, they were getting ready. Their whole division, which was the 5th Mechanized Infantry Division, were getting ready to go to Vietnam. And he didn't want me because he'd have to turn right around and send me back home. So he just told me to report for Reveille every morning, and I had a 60-day vacation there. And I processed out on December 7th. Now, actually, when you left Vietnam, you were anxious to simply get away, mm -hmm. and you didn't, you didn't even bring your medals with you? Is that correct? No. When, when you left the base, again, you were at the, the, the admin deal. They would they give you three, uh, three medals. Everybody that was in Vietnam when I was there uh, had three medals. You had the National Defense Medal, which actually everybody in the military gets that medal. And then you had the Vietnam Service Medal that the Vietnamese government awarded to you. And then you had a, a, an American uh, Vietnam Service Medal with one bronze or two bronze or whatever citations that you had. And uh, I, I just didn't even really care. I just wanted out. And I just said, keep it. I later, 20 years later, I wrote to uh, the records department in St. Louis, Missouri, and uh, told them that I never collected my medals, and they sent them to me. So. Okay. Uh, all right, so you're at Fort Carson. Uh, you're uh, finally uh, uh, you're, uh, uh, released from duty. Uh, you came back to Bremerton then, is that correct? That's correct. And uh, started school, winter quarter. Uh, at the junior college, and um, my, my father got me a job at a drugstore that he worked at part-time. He was actually a full-time uh, employee in the shipyard. And uh, I took a full load at junior college and was working 48 hours a week at the drugstore, and I lasted about 60, 90 days, and uh, my marriage broke down, and I was a mess. I just, so I quit. Uh, ended up uh, joining the Teamsters Union, and started driving a truck between Burlington and Seattle and uh, just ultimately settled in Seattle. But it took me about four years to kind of get back on track. Okay, so uh, this is, again, conversations about the war in Vietnam. My guest has been Bob Parmalee, and I want to thank you, Bob, so much for coming you and sharing too. with mm -hmm. us. Appreciate Thanks. that.